Hey, uh, so in my neighborhood, and I live here in Manteca, um, we had a new family move in. They moved into a two-story home, and uh, we kind of live on the end of a cul-de-sac, and uh, they were moving their stuff in, and uh, I was watching them and, and all that, and, and I noticed after the furniture and everything, they started moving in some cars, and it's so, okay, they got a three-car garage, and And I noticed they had three cars in the garage. And then they brought in a couple more cars that were in the driveway. And I'm starting to count. Okay, that's five. And uh, then they started uh, uh, bringing in some cars. They were running out of room. So they parked kind of a junker car in front of my house. And I'm like, praise the Lord, bless your heart. So (laughs) then I noticed noticed some tow trucks come in with some cars. And they kept adding cars to the driveway and in the front. And, and I thought, well, isn't that special? So I, I talked to some of my neighbors. I said, hey, we got some new neighbors. And they said, yeah, I noticed. <laughs> They've got a lot of cars. Matter of fact, they brought with them a whole used car lot. So... You know, and some of the other neighbors notice. And, and uh, in, now you got to realize, I don't have anything, I don't have no problem with anybody working on their car in their garage or in their driveway. That's fine. But, you know, opening up a car shop in a neighborhood, I'm not sure about that, okay? So uh, me and some of the neighbor guys, the question came up, you going to talk to them? <laughs> My neighbor goes, well, I don't like it, but I'm not going to talk to them. And I asked the guy that lived next door to him, what about you, Vince? You want to talk to him? I'm going to let it chill a little bit. (laughs) And then maybe I'll talk to him. And they go about, what are you going to do, pastor? (laughs) I'm going to pray for him, then I'm going to give it to him. All right, so (laughs) anyway... I prayed about it, and, and then uh, they were out in, in the middle of the cul-de-sac, and I went up, and I introduced myself, and I um, said, yeah, tell me about it. And, yeah, we got a couple families here, and, you know, uh, uh, we, we're, we love this neighborhood. It's so nice. And I was inside, I'm thinking it was, but uh, <laughs> I'm terrible. I'm, I'm bad, right? Anyway, I said, hey, I noticed you guys have got a lot of cars, and I said, I said, is this like your business or something? And the guy goes, he looked at me a little awkwardly, he smiled, he goes, no, we're just car enthusiasts. I said, oh, well, I'm a neighborhood enthusiast. And, uh, you know, you might want to uh, settle it down on all the cars, okay? And he goes, oh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Anyway, I bring up that story because I'm a grumpy old man. No, no, that's not. I bring up that story because sometimes we find, you know, folks will just kind of do their own thing, right? Uh, folks will just kind of not really uh, consider their neighbors or, or other people. Um, they'll kind of just do what's right in their own eyes. And, um, you know, they, they might just steal from other people, and that's not a problem. That doesn't upset their moral compass at all. They might cheat in school. They might cheat in business. They might cheat on their spouse. They might break the law. They might take advantage of other people, uh, act selfishly. So the problem is this, and this is where we're going to start if you're following along in your note sheets. Uh, The problem is when everybody does what is right in their own eyes. Can you imagine if our society lived that way? Some of you are thinking our society does live that way. Well, let me tell you, they really live that way back in Bible times, back in Old Testament times, during the time, the period of history known as the Judges uh, in Israel. And it tells us in Judges chapter 17, verse 6, in those days, there was no king in Israel. This was before Uh, Israel had kings, before King Saul, before King David. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Let me give you a little background. We're starting a new sermon series today uh, from the book of Judges. We spent a lot of time in the New Testament over the last couple of years 
Uh, so I want to feed us from uh, all the portions of Scripture. We did a four-week series in the book of Ruth, and Ruth occurred historically during the period of the Judges. So as I prayed about it, I thought, let's tackle the Judges, all right? The Judges occurred after uh, the book of Joshua uh, in your Bibles. And Joshua was the man who followed Moses. Moses brought the children of Israel to the promised land, modern day Israel basically. And Joshua was the man who came in and fought uh, most of the major battles to conquer the promised land. Now we get to the book of Judges because the job wasn't finished. And now Israel needed to inhabit the promised land and possess uh, the promised land. So this all happened about 1400 to 1050 BC. But again, the problem was there was no king in Israel. In the past, Moses had led the millions of Israelites through the desert. And then Joshua led the millions of Israelites as they came in to the promised land. But now there was no one leader. And so the tribes just kind of managed themselves and it was a time of chaos, a time of disobedience to God. They intermarried with uh, the pagan nations that were in the promised land, which God told them specifically, don't do that. Uh, there was apostasy, a falling away from worshiping the one true God. There was immorality and lawlessness and spiritual decay. And the result was this, that the children of Israel did not enjoy the benefits and the blessings that God had intended for them to enjoy in the land that he had given them. In short, Israel did not obey God. They didn't obey God. Now, obedience, we have to realize, obedience is not a bad word, okay? It's not even a four-letter word, okay? Obedience isn't a bad word, but you don't hear obedience preached in a lot of pulpits today. We don't like to talk about things that are uncomfortable, like disobedience or, or sin. But you've got to realize that obedience, God gave us the command to obey him and obey his word so that it might free us to enjoy his love and his peace and to have lives of joy and, and hope in Jesus Christ. And we learn the commands of Scripture and to obey them through knowing God's Word. Through knowing God's Word. Think of it this way. God is the author of life. God is the author of life, and His Word is the instruction manual. Right? His Word is the instruction manual. So this morning, we're going to look uh, at the qualities of a life of obedience obedience as we look at Judges chapter 1, all right? But before we do, let's talk with God. Father in heaven, we want to thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your house this morning. Your word tells us where two or three are gathered, there your spirit is also. We recognize the presence of your Holy Spirit among us. We thank you for your word. And we pray, Lord, that we would be people that not only uh, read the word, not only people who know the word, but people who obey your word. To obey is better than sacrifice. So God, be with us this morning. Move our hearts and minds to be the people you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, a life of obedience First, life of obedience listens closely to God in times of transition. Times of transition, right? We all go through times of transition in our lives, and I find that those are times we need to particularly listen to the voice of God to obey his commands, because we can get off track pretty easy during times of transition. Now again, Joshua led Israel for, for seven years, conquering the promised land. Uh, he defeated 31 kings. Now, back in those days, every city had their own king. 
So think of it like uh, if that was true today, you'd have the king of Manteca. We all know that's Jim Benedict. You'd have the king of Modesto, the king of Stockton, all right? All those things. And, and Joshua came in and he defeated 31 kings and he ruled Israel for 25 years. But then Joshua died. Again, no one to take his place. Time of transition for Israel. Now, they still had a job to do. Uh, Israel's job was this, to drive out the wicked inhabitants from the land and to possess it, to live there. Um, God said this in Exodus chapter 23, verses 23 to 25. God said, when my angel goes before you, Israelites, into the promised land and brings you to the land of the Amorites. Now, these are the pagan nations. The Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Termites, the Parasites, all the ites you can think of, all right? And God says, when, when my angel brings you there, I'm going to blot them out, okay? God's going to destroy them. Uh, and you shall not bow down to their gods. That's why God was so angry with these pagan nations. They were idol worshipers. You, and you won't bow down to their gods. You're not going to serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. He's saying, listen, when you go into the promised land and you see a bunch of rocks piled up with some wood on it, and this is an altar that they built to their idol god, you tear it down. We're going to have none of that in Israel, in the promised land that I am giving you, uh, God said. Verse 25, you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water and will take sickness away from you. So God is going to prepare this promised land for his people and at the same time, he's going to use his people to judge the wickedness of those who are in the land. A lot of people have a hard time with the God of the Old Testament. How could the God of the Old Testament do those things? How can he wipe out a whole people group? Because in God's eyes, they were evil. In God's eyes, they were wicked. In God's eyes, they had fallen to the lowest low of human depravity. That's why. The other thing to think of is this. It is not my job or your job to defend God. Think of that. God is sovereign. God is in control. God will do what God will do. And I understand that it's difficult sometimes when we get to uh, the Old Testament God. But again, we need to accept that our God is who he is and he, that he works within his own counsel and his own wisdom. So the question then is, will the children of Israel listen and obey the commands of God? Will they come in and inhabit the land? Will they not bow down to the idol gods in Israel? Will they not intermarry? Well, let's see how it started off in Judges chapter 1. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. It says, Now after the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord. So they're praying to God. Good start, Israel. And they asked, Who shall go up first uh, for us against the Canaanites? They were going into the land of Canaan. Sometimes the Canaanites uh, represents all the peoples, all the, 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 the pagan tribes. Who's going to go up against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Yahweh, the one true God said, Judah, the tribe of Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> Who goes up first against our enemies? And God responds, Judah, I've already given the land into his hand. That's awesome. I mean, you pray to God, and he tells you exactly what he's going to do. He assures you that he's already given you victory. That's like taking on a big army, and you're David with the little slingshot, baby. Right? You look like you're outgunned, 
And you're out, man, but God already said, I've got this. I've already given the land into your hand. Trust me. Listen to me. Obey me, and let's go do this. Let's make it, let's make it happen. Now, let's bring it back to us. Are you experiencing a time of transition in your life? Um, maybe you've got uh, a kid going off to college. Or maybe you find yourself in a new relationship. I know a lot of you Del Webbers out there, you're always dating each other if you're single. I get it. I know they have dances over there. I know, I know. So maybe you're in a new relationship, all right? Or, or maybe you just got married. That's a transition. Or, or maybe you're ready to have a child. That's a transition. Or, or maybe you've just moved here, or you're getting ready to move away. That's a transition. Or, or you just... Uh, entered that season of retirement or maybe some things in your health have changed and, and that's a transition you know our family um, my last kiddo my daughter uh, is going off to college and that's a transition for for my wife and I and and my daughter um, she's going to uh, a public university um, and and just my experience from my older kids, you know, they get a good education, but they're taught a lot of different things. And they need to filter their faith through some of those things. So when my daughter uh, chose to go to one of these public universities, we just said, okay, here's a couple of things. Now, we know you have a strong faith, but it's important that you find a people group with your same Christian values. So uh, why don't you try to find a Christian roommate? And then get connected with a Christian group on campus. And then find a local church, okay? And she's, she's doing all those things. And we're so grateful. And then, in my paranoia, though, I, I went out and bought her like four or five books <laughs> on defending your faith, okay? Just in case she's got questions, right? I'm giving her a whole library here. Want some more books? Thanks, Dad. You know, that sort of thing. But it's a time of transition, and I want to make sure that she is still loving, following, and obeying God. Listen, a life of obedience is always listening for the voice of God in their situation. How do we listen to the voice of God? Pick up your Bible and read it. This is God's written word to us. The next thing to do is spend time in prayer, not just a quick prayer uh, for lunch or dinner, okay? Spend a little time with God. That's all prayer is, talking with God, okay? Uh, spend some time in worship, and you can hear the voice of God. Spend some time talking with uh, respected uh, Christian friends to hear their input and their counsel on whatever transitions or life issues you might be going through. So a life of obedience First, listens closely to God in times of transition. Secondly, a life of obedience requires strong faith during times of testing. Now, I get people that come into my office every week who are going through a challenge. And their faith is being tested. It could be with their kids. It could be with their marriage. It could be with their finances. It could be with their health. You name it. And they come in. And we talk about those things. Now, back to our, our, our study. Now, Joshua's generation, they were faithful to the Lord, but they all passed on. Then a, a new generation of Israelites who would need to go and inhabit Israel, possess the land, drive out the inhabitants. That was their job. The question is, were they going to do it? It was going to be a test of their faith for this next generation. It would require strong faith. And Joshua gave them a charge before he died. And Joshua said in the book of Joshua, chapter 23, verses 5 to 8, Joshua is telling the people, and it's, it says, The Lord your God will push them back before you. Those evil tribal groups and nations. Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight. And you shall possess their land just as the Lord your God has promised. 
Therefore, notice what it says, be very strong. Circle it, underline it, highlight it. You got to be very strong during these times of testing. You got to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. All right? Obey God's law. Um, uh, Neither to the right hand nor to the left. Don't turn aside from it. That you may not mix with the nations remaining among you. Mixing with the nations, that means intermarrying with them. Don't do that. Why did God, why was that such a big deal to God? Because when the, when the Israelites would intermarry with uh, the pagan nations, then typically the Israelites would fall away from worshiping God and start worshiping idol gods. That's why. That's why. Your spouse has a huge influence on you. So God says, don't mix uh, with them. Don't mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods. God says, I don't want to hear about Chemosh. I don't want to hear about about Moloch. I don't want to hear about the Baals in the land. And I don't want you to swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. What, what, What are we supposed to do? Joshua says, you shall cling to the Lord your God. Cling to the Lord your God just as you have done to this day. Hold on with all your might. Cling to God. Obey his word. Have strong faith and you'll be able to pass the tests. So how did the 12 tribes of Israel respond? Well, some of them had victories. Judah and Simeon down the south. By the way, I gave you a map in your programs, so you can kind of get an idea of what the promised land looked like, the land that was uh, allocated to the 12 tribes, and that they were supposed to inhabit that land. You can see where some of the judges would come up and the areas where they would have influence. That's all on that map. You, wanna, you might want to keep that, tuck it away in your Bible somewhere for the, for the messages to come. So let's see how the 12 tribes did. Let's go to Judges chapter 1 and verse 6. We're not going to go through them all, but we're going to highlight some. So Judah went up first to fight against the people of the land. And, uh, and they, they came across uh, Adonai Bezek, this king. And they defeated him and the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Verse 6, Adonai Bezek, this pagan king, he fled, but... They pursued him, and they caught him, and they cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Welcome to the Old Testament, baby. That's how they rolled, okay? Now, that was actually very kind. That was nice. And it was also disobedient. They they cut off his thumbs and his toes so he could never hold a sword again, so he could never walk into battle again. And really, though, they should have killed him. So right here, the the tribe of Judah is not completely obeying and following the Lord and his commands. Uh, Let's go and see uh, Judges chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. It says, now Judah also captured Gaza. Gee, where have we heard that before? With its territory. And Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. So Judah came in, and they were obedient, and they captured all these cities. Okay, they were driving the people out, just as God had told them. Verse 19, and the Lord was with Judah. Yeah, God is with them. He's empowering them. And Judah took possession of the hill country. Now we got problems, but... Judah could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had iron chariots. They're doing great. God is with them. They're having victory. They're being obedient, and all of a sudden, they come across this certain group of people who had tanks. What are we going to do? They've got iron chariots, and they failed in their mission. Now, If you know your Old Testament a little bit, God doesn't have any problem with iron chariots. Now, the Israelites didn't have iron chariots, 
But there was a guy in their past who did, a guy by the name of Pharaoh, who chased the children of Israel through the desert with his army and with his iron chariots. And the people of Israel went through uh, the Red Sea as God parted it for them. And as Pharaoh and his army and his soldiers with their spears and their swords and their iron chariots tried to follow them, God allowed the water to go over them. And their chariots got stuck in the mud and they were destroyed. So my question is, does God have a problem with iron chariots? No. No. That's not a problem for God, but Judah had a problem with them. And they left the people in the land. What about a guy named Caleb? Caleb uh, was one of the old, salty, tough leaders of the Israelites. He was good friends with Joshua. And Caleb was still around. And Caleb, he had a strong faith. And, 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 and he was a leader in the tribe of Judah. And he directed the capture of Hebron, which is a major city in the southern part of Israel. And it tells us in Judges chapter 1, verse 20, and Hebron was given to Caleb, as Moses had said, and Caleb drove out from it the three sons of Anak. So Caleb, what I want you to see here, he got business done. He got his soldiers together, and he defeated three kings. He did his job. He drove them out. Caleb was was faithful. He obeyed God completely. Consider this. God will often test our faith through trials to strengthen it. As I look back over my life, I can see hindsight is 20-20, right? I can see pretty clearly now As I look back over the different seasons of my life, when I have gone through some of the most difficult struggles in my life, those could be interpreted as times where the Lord was testing my faith to see if I was going to obey him, to see if I was going to put away my selfishness, my ego, my desires, my wants, to see if I was going to respond to him, not in a selfish way, but in a sacrificial and obedient way. And the Bible tells us in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, count it all joy, my brothers and my sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. We're going to meet all kinds of different trials, from a flat tire to a, to a painful diagnosis. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or endurance. God brings us trials to make our faith true and, and strong. So a life of obedience listens closely to God in times of transition. A life of obedience requires strong faith during times of testing. And a life of obedience keeps God's commands completely, not partially. (laughs) Now you might say, wait a minute, Pastor. That's not reasonable. How can I obey all of God's commands? How can I be, how can I knock it out of the park all the time? How can I always do the loving thing, the unselfish thing. I mean, remember back in the day when they had that uh, what would Jesus do thing? And everybody had a little bracelet, WWJD, what would Jesus do? What if I can't do what Jesus did all the time? You know, I I try, I'm pretty good, I'm pretty good. I obey kinda, sorta, best I can, right? Let me ask you a question. What if your teenagers came up to you and said, Hey, mom and dad, I'll obey you half the time. Will that work? (laughs) You're going to say, no, it's not. Would you like to go up for adoption? (laughs) Right? You got to obey, man. You you wouldn't take that from your kids. and, And God expects us to be all in, to to obey him to the best of our ability with the right heart completely, not Partially. Now, 
The tribes of Israel, they failed to drive out and destroy the wicked inhabitants of the promised land. Okay? Now you might ask, how did this happen? Well, they didn't listen to God's commands closely. They didn't exhibit strong faith in every situation when they were tested. They were a spiritual decline amongst the whole nation, and they only obeyed God partially, and they made compromises. Give you a couple examples. In Judges chapter 1, verse 21, the tribe of Benjamin, the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. That's a big deal. We've all heard of Jerusalem. This is before Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. There were Jebusites living there, pagan, idol-worshiping people, and the tribe of Benjamin, it was their job to go in and, and defeat those people, drive them out. Jerusalem was located on a hill, and it was a very strategic place, and they failed to drive out the Jebusites. So the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. They didn't keep God's command completely. It wouldn't be another two to three hundred years later until King David finally got in there and drove the Jebusites out. And you wonder why David is known as the man after God's own heart. Because with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind, he strove to obey God completely. David wasn't in it partially. David was all in. Now, was he perfect? Absolutely not. Did he sin? Yes. Did he make mistakes? Yes. Just like you and me. I think that's why we relate to David so well. But his heart was in the right place. The Benjamites just gave up. We can't, we can't kick these guys out of here. We'll just live with them. We'll go to the PTA meetings with the parents, their kids. We'll do soccer with them, whatever, right? He just said, okay. What about the tribes of Ephraim and Zebulun? Uh, in, uh, in Judges 1, 29, and Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in, in Gezer. So the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalal. So the Canaanites lived among them, but they did become subject to them in forced labor. What about the tribe of Dan? They were pathetic. It says in verse 34, the Amorites pressed, they oppressed the people of Dan, that tribe, back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. Hey, Dan, <laughs> didn't God already promise that he would go before you in battle? Didn't God already tell you the battle is his? Listen to him, trust him, follow him, exhibit strong faith, obey him. Dan's like, I don't think I can do that. And the Amorites kicked their butt. And they didn't possess the land that God had given them. When they lived among the inhabitants, that means they intermarried with them, they combined with them, they started to worship the idol gods that were there. Some might have kept God's commands partially, but it doesn't look like anybody really kept God's commands completely. Now, what about us? Again, you might say, hey, pastor, man, you're laying it down thick this morning. <laughs> well, I thought y'all were ready for a little OT Christianity, all right? <laughs> Let's do a little Old Testament, Calvary, okay? I'm talking to myself, too. A lot of us will say, hey, pastor, you know, I mean, I, I, I sin. I know you do. I do, too. I try to keep God's commands. I know you do. So do I. But I'm not perfect and I mess up. I know that. Praise God for Jesus. God knows that too. We, 
We can't, we can't keep the law perfectly. It was never meant to. It was meant to show us what sin is. It was meant to show us how weak we are. And then God came and paid our sin through his son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, it tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. It says, and by this we know that we have come to know Jesus if we keep his commandments. If you take your faith seriously, you're going to want to try to obey God's commands because your heart's in the right place. You're probably going to trip up. You're probably going to stumble. You're probably going to fall. But again, thank God for Jesus, right? The Bible tells us in, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Got a friend who started to come to the church his name was Brian. Brian uh, had fallen away from the Lord. He was married, had some kids. Uh, he found himself coming home every night drinking, uh, smoking weed. Uh, he was getting tattoos and everything all over, and uh, his marriage was struggling, and his wife started coming here. And uh, she mentioned to him, she said, you know, honey, it seemed like our marriage and our family, we were doing a lot better when we were going to church, when we were making God's word and Jesus an important part of our lives. She says, why don't you come? And he was a little hesitant. I thought, nah, they'll probably just judge me. But Brian shows up. Hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit gets a hold of him. Yes. And in his heart, starts to change and he repented and he recommitted his life to following the Lord not partially but completely and and since he's been coming he said man it has strengthened my marriage it's brought my family back and and I have stopped all that stuff I was doing and I'm experiencing so much joy in my life I mean every time I come here he tackles me with a big hug every time and he's got a big smile on his face, and he's involved in ministry, and he's serving. And I'm just telling you that God is real. Jesus is real. The power of the Holy Spirit is real. It can, cha it can change lives, church. It can change lives. But we don't approach God partially. We approach him completely. We learn to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. That's what living a life of obedience looks like. Will you choose to do that in your life? That's the question.